illustration. Once there lived a certain king with his queen and three courtiers who were eligible to act for the king should he be absent and to succeed him should he be dead. These courtiers lusted after the person of the queen and were jealous. Each of them wanted very much to have an affair with her, but because but because they discovered how faithful the queen was to her king, they feared they had failed in their individual attempt to elicit love with her. All three of them plotted to rape her or cause her death should she resist or disgrace them by refusing their approach. Their jealousy against the queen raised so fiercely that they started to call her names and to say the queen was disrespectful, looking down on every person. Being courtiers, they were much trusted, loved by the people and allowed unlimited access to the court. They used this advantage to secure themselves a hiding place in the court from where they could pounce on the queen. The queen was returning from bathing alone. Halfway through the bathroom, her escort of maids had stopped to wait for her to go and come back to join them. But before they could see their queen again, the three courtiers had jumped from their hiding place to grip her and demanded love affair. You know that we are courtiers, much honored in this kingdom, and that we have equal power with the king, your husband, so that whatever we say must be done, and whosoever refuses to do what we want, we have power to condemn them to death. Yes, of course, she replied, and now we want you to love three of us as you love the king and to allow us to have the same right on your person as the king. If you refuse, you will be killed. The queen was maddened by what, by what to her sounded the most treasonable thing ever spoken by man. Boldly, she told them that by having the thought to approach her with such ignoble question, they had already committed a great crime, a moral sin, and for opening their mouths to utter such dirty words, they were already dead. As for herself, should she ever think in her heart of having an affair with any one of them, she should die. And for her to agree to do so when they demanded it, she should die. God forbid that she should not do any such thing. The three courtiers were greatly disappointed and disgraced. They must revenge. So they raised an alarm and summoned the whole court and the whole kingdom to the palace. There they explained to the people how they had caught the queen having an affair with another man. And when they came up to catch them, the man escaped. This was noised throughout the land and everybody knew the penalty for such a crime was death and that the queen was soon to die. Many blamed her for such act, which from the evidence of the courtiers, they believed she had committed the offense and were very sorry that she was to die such a disgraceful death. But the three friends who plotted it were very happy, yet the queen was not in any way ruffled. Her heart did not condemn her because she had committed no offense 
according to the law of the land, there was nothing remaining to prevent her execution. The courtiers were trusted to say the truth in the evidence which they gave against the queen, and no other evidence was needed to disprove what they had said. Whatever the queen had to say to defend herself was not to be listened to. The execution of the queen was fixed at 8 o'clock the next morning. So the people dispersed with awful impression of what had happened. In the night, one of the prominent young men had a dream of the true nature of the case for the queen. The next morning, when all assembled to watch her execution, the young man cried out that he would not bear to see an innocent person executed before his eyes and that he had the other side of the queen caught man of the queen caught with man's story to tell them. He was granted audience. He called the nobles privately and asked them to separate the three courtiers and then cross-examine them one by one. No uh, to know their individual version of how they caught the queen with a man. The three of them were kept at distances that made it impossible for them to see or hear one another. When they were called in and cross-examined, one of them said, I caught the queen having an affair with a man under the mango tree. And when we came running to catch them, the man escaped. He was taken aside, still far away. The second courtier who was called in said, He saw the queen and the man under the pear tree. The third courtier said, He saw them under the coconut tree. There was no collaboration in the evidence given by the three friends and this proved that they conspired to kill the queen they were guilty of high treason and were condemned to die from the on the gallows before the death sentence pronounced on them the queen was called to say how everything happened she told them a very pathetic story of how these courtiers had sought to have an affair with her and when she refused, they turned to say that they had caught her with a man. Everything the courtiers said were false. Things changed automatically. The queen was set free while the three courtiers were hanged by the same rope which was earlier prepared for the queen. Second lesson, Jesus answered him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. In the above illustration, the queen who committed no sin could not in any way be brought under punishment of sin. But the courtiers as sinners were serving, were serving sin from the day they started to worry themselves, planning how to get the queen into their lustful trap. They told lies and suffered shame and finally died for their sin. Therefore, let us run away from sin, even the least type. In thought, word or deed, we should not sin at all, for disgrace, tribulation and death await all sinners. Women ought not to suffer any pain in delivering children. Men ought not to suffer for their daily bread. But today, the sufferings we have are due to our own sins. If we commit no sin, we shall experience no difficulty in anything. So let us run away from sin, so that sin will run away from us, and we shall be free and never again to serve under its bondage forever and ever. Golden text. 
Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord. We have already started and will continue to explain to you where, what harm sin has done to this world. If our forefathers long ago and the philosophers of today had known earlier that sin is the cause of all the troubles in the world, death would have ceased entirely by now. For sin is the cause of all our tribulations and death. The increasing death roll today is alarming and has set everybody thinking as to how to stop it. And there in, and there in our lesson today, we have been shown the cause of death, which should be removed if death must stop. We must therefore refrain from sin, for sin is the cause of death. The only reward or profit we derive from sin is death. Why then do the people of the world cling to sin? Or does it mean, or does it then mean that the world does not want life? If we quarrel, backbite, steal, hate, or fornicate, cause division, fight, and curse, we must die. Why then should those who desire life do any of these things? We all have noted how our bodies and feelings react to sin. Once you backbite somebody, your whole person is thrown into a state of confusion. In our conscience, we are no more free and happy than we used to be as we used to be in the company of the person we backbite. All the sins and illness we may suffer are only minor consequences. Death is the final wages we are paid for these sins, for the sins we commit. It is the sum set aside for a sinner to earn a pension. When a sinner dies, God has no hand in his death, for he has been paid his pension by sin. God is eternal life. Sin is death. Sinners suffer terrible things in the course of sinning. For instance, a thief cannot tell how often he has been attacked, stoned, and buffeted. His escape from death and his ordeal under rain and sun. If we consider these things, we need not be told to run away from sin. Apart from sin, there is no person or angel who has the right to destroy the life of any, of any person. If anybody dies, and if you investigate the cause, you will discover it is sin. If you see anybody who has eternal life, it is given him by God. People wonder why this or that prominent person should die. I ask, has he not committed sin and does deserve to die? We keep on explaining this thing to you because some think that God is responsible for our illness and death. Some say that death is that death has power. No, it is sin, not death, that has power. God knows that sin has power to punish sinners with death. He does not obstruct anybody who, after being told to refrain from sin, still continues in it. He knows that every sinner will earn his reward. Illustration Once there was a synod attended only by very high dignitaries from the rank of bishop and above, from all over the world, the number of them being about 2,000. At the end of their deliberation, one of the bishops was to serve up Holy Communion. He prepared and brought it out, but when he was going to start 
serving thunder attack. I repeat that. But when he was going to start serving thunder struck, the table was overturned, the bread scattered, and the wine was spilled all over the floor. The bishop himself was killed, and these things happened because the bishop who died had secretly poisoned the food when he was preparing it. His plan to kill all the bishops present at the synod was a direct attack on God himself. He had committed a grievous sin and the wages of and the wages he received was his own death. Before he died he confessed the many acts of cruelty he he used to commit and expressly told the people that the death he would suffer was what wages he deservedly earned for all the atrocities he was committing in his life. This story also illustrates that Satan is not afraid of God and does not scruple to tempt the children of God in the house of God. Disguising himself as an angel of God, but whatever form the sinner may take, his end is death. So brethren, let us refrain from sin if we desire to have eternal life as the gift of God and gain victory over death now and forevermore. Those who have ears, let them hear. May God bless his holy word. Amen. The Prince of the World Comet. First lesson, John chapter 14, verse 30. Second lesson, Luke chapter 5, verse 11. Third lesson, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and art nothing in me. Brethren, I know you will be afraid of this gospel, but I can't help delivering the same to you, because, some, because so many people have been deceiving you. So many too claim to be this or that, but, this, but the gospel of this evening is going to explain everything to you. Christ says in the first lesson that when the prince of this world cometh, he will not see anything in him, which means there was not a pin with him left because he never put his mind in any of the worldly things. He forsook all the worldly pleasures. He, he forsook even his parents, brethren and sisters. That was why he was able to do his father's work. He did not say, let me go and educate my brothers and sisters first of all. When he saw that the world would perish, he decided to forsake everything so as to redeem the world. That is why you and I are saved today. If you want to follow Christ, you have to do likewise, for it is said that to be friendly with the world is to be enemy of God.